Here on the Colour of Country Life, also broadcasting in Cooper Pedy, we're speaking now with the, he's the former administrator for Cooper Pedy, Tim Jackson. Tim, thanks for joining us on Flow. Fine, Ricky. Uh, now, Tim, just to clarify, you've only very recently ceased to be the administrator there at Cooper Pedy, is that right? Yes, today's. Today's my first day as uh, not the administrator. Yep, yep. So the government has appointed someone who, because you had indicated you, you were resigning or concluding that position, I believe. Yeah, look, I, I'd, I'd done it for four years um, and uh, the elections were, sh- were, were scheduled for, um, well, as, as they were in the rest of the state, uh, for November last year. So, um, and then the government decided that it wasn't possible to have an elected council back. So I sort of signed on for that term um, and I've obviously extended it, well, initially I extended it till Christmas and then till the end of January whilst they were looking for someone. Uh, so I flagged out 12 months ago that I wanted to cease and uh, I'm, I'm off to India for six months. Well, good for you. But look, uh, just before you nick off to India, I just thought we would um, just reflect on uh, just the circumstances why you ended up there. So basically the Cooper Pedy, the District Council of Cooper Pedy had elected members, but then it ceased to have those members. The government had to step in and appoint an administrator. Is that right? That's right. In, in in, uh, in January 2019 that occurred, yes. Yeah. And what were you trying to do in that four years that you were there in terms of getting things back on, if I could put it this way, an even keel? Yeah, yeah. Look, the, the place was... Uh, there'd, been two, there'd been two inquiries into the council, uh, one by the Auditor-General and one by the Ombudsman, which weren't particularly complementary towards the council. You know, a lot of governance issues, you know, financial matters. Uh, and, of course, the significant issue was the letting of the contract for the supply uh, of, of electricity, so sustainable um, power, which was a huge contract, about 150 odd million dollars, without going to tender. Um, so the, the ombudsman had a look at that. So those two inquiries resulted in the government suspending the, the newly elected council because they were elected in November 2018, whilst the government was sitting on uh, these two reports. And these poor people put their hand up to try and fix things. And, and then in, in January, the government, uh, January 2019, the government moved on those two reports and uh, suspended those people who'd really put their hand up to try and fix things. Um, so that was pretty unfortunate. And yeah, and they appointed me to try try and sort things out. But, yeah, look, the place was in a mess, Ricky. Um, really, really, everything. Everywhere you looked, there was a problem. Just, you know, processes and systems and, you know, regulations. You know, we're, you know, we're a power and water supplier and, you know, you know we weren't complying with any regulations and all that sort of stuff. And, so just- and that's one of the um, the peculiarities for a council like Cooper Pedy is that unlike other regional councils, and much more remote than a lot of councils, uh, the, the council itself is responsible for major utility provision in the form of power and water. And I, I imagine was did that something that was sort of became something beyond the uh, capabilities of local people that were on the council? Yeah, look, I th- look, I think that's probably fair to say, and, and 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 poor management as well. There were five CEOs in six years, you know, no continuity, and but there's no other council uh, that, that does um, electricity and water like we like we do. Um, Roxy Downs is responsible for council is responsible for water and electricity, but of course the electric, you know, they're getting that electricity and that water from Adelaide. I mean, we have to produce the water, you know, we have to produce the power. Um, so yeah, very very unique. And then we, you know, we had to run air, we ran an airport. We run a childcare centre, um, you know, so we do things that councils don't normally do because there's no one else in town to do it. That's right. And look, uh, before we talk a bit more about some other matters that have been in the spotlight lately, just give paint us a picture of what life is like in Cooper, Peter. You've spent three or four years living there yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I um, initially I was there full time the first twelve months, and then I and then I reverted to I became a sort of fly in fly out, uh, two weeks on, you know, two weeks off type thing uh, each month. Um, but yeah, I invested, bought a bought a dugout, um, so we, you know, lived underground. Yeah, no, it's great. And I got you know I got actively involved. You know, I was a, I was a volunteer at the you know we, we've got the only drive-in left in South Australia. It's run it's run solely by volunteers. Uh, That's I, a very good point, actually. Uh, the Wallace people, when the one closed down at Jeps Cross, said it was the last. Last one in South Australia, but not quite true. No, no, there's no, no Cooper Pedy's uh, still going, and we uh, well, well, on Australia Day we had brand new day, and uh, that was on the th- that was on the Thursday night, and then the, and then it was still open again on the Saturday night as well. So yeah, solely run by volunteers. I, vol- I, I run the canteen sort of you know one one night a month, and um, so you know I've got in. We started park run up. I was involved in that. There's only three park runs in Central Australia, and we've got one of them. Yep. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of good stuff going on in town, and tourism's been, you know, incredibly strong. You know, during COVID, with people not being able to get, you know, offshore, and 
that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, the town's, um, you know, it's got its issues, of course, uh, which we might talk about in a moment, but, yep. uh, but you know, there, there are you know, a, lot of, a lot of positive things um, as well, yeah. Yeah, that's right, and I wanted to start on the positives, because, uh, you know, <laughs> the local community uh, loves the place and keeps living there uh, for good reason, but uh, you have highlighted, uh, even in a press release issue just before you finished, about antisocial behaviour in the town, particularly in Hutchison Street. You published a letter the Premier wrote mid-January about this situation, just... What is the general situation, the problem? I think you've pointed a lot to the sale of alcohol and the amount of restrictions already in place, but maybe more were needed. Yeah, yeah. Look, you know, I, it's, a comp, look, it's, a, it's a complex issue. Uh, and, of course, um, you know, you know centres like Port Augusta and Sojourner are experiencing similar, you know, similar sorts of uh, uh, issues. Um, and... Um, uh, and, and there's not one fix for it, you know, and, and you would have seen, I mean, I did suggest, make a range of suggestions to the Premier. Um, I've got to say, though, um, I mean, it was disappointing. I mean, I think I wrote that letter in June of last year and I, I got uh, I got an answer in January uh, and um, this year. Uh, and I think I, I must have rung nine times, I think, to try and ascertain when I was going to get a response. So it's a multi-pronged uh, response. Um, yeah, look, uh, you know, essentially, you know, alcohol is available in Cooper Pedy and uh, uh, so that, you know, attracts, um, you, know, you know, non-locals. Uh, they obviously stay in town for, for, for some time and... Uh, and then, you know, might move on, might transition, you know, through to, to Port Augusta. So is there a view amongst the local community, the perception is, like you mentioned the term non-locals, it's people coming from out of town to access those services. Is there a resident problem or is it more a visitor problem? No, it's a visitor problem. Yeah, most definitely a visitor problem. So, you know, and, and these people, of course, you know, don't live in the town, so they do, you know, they, they congregate. Um, that's just natural. That's human, that's a human, you know, human behaviour. Um, so... Um, you know, and they sleep. You know, they sleep rough. So, uh, yeah. And a lot of those things, some people would be, you know, could could cope with, I suppose, in terms of how people are are living. But it's you mentioned antisocial behaviour. What are we talking about? Violence in the streets or loud arguments or what? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. Probably. You know. Um. Not. You know. Certainly not. You know. Violence. It, it's more. You know. That sort of behaviour. You know, where someone's inebriated. Um. You know. Yeah. They do raise their voice, and you know, they are. You know, yelling and screaming and stuff like that, and um, and and of course, people, you know, particularly tourists who are not used to this sort of thing, uh, uh, you know, I, you know, do feel threatened. Uh, but you know, but honestly, you know, there's not there's not violence. Tourists aren't being assaulted or that sort of stuff. You know, for a lot of people, they feel uncomfortable. Uh, but is it is it vocal? Vocal? Are there actual threats being made to people, or is it simply that there's people are very vocal and people aren't used to yeah. people being so loud and directing their communication? Yeah, yeah I think that's right. Yeah, but. You know, people will ask you for money and that sort of stuff and that sort of uh, behaviour, yeah. So as if anything, it sounds and, like it's more... A, you know, drink and drinking in the main, you know, and drinking in yeah. public place, yeah. And, and if anything, that sounds more like um, socially confronting behaviour. No one's... Mm. people Unless you're someone who's not familiar with it, you're not feeling like your safety's threatened by the circumstances. Yeah, that's right. No, that's it. That's it, yeah. Yeah, well, look, Tim, it's we're trying to get a bit of a picture of what's going on. Cooper Petey's name is popping up a bit more in conversations uh, around South Australia in the studio. So someone who's been on the ground, very useful to get their um, perspective and, and bearing in mind this is the first day that you are um, no longer the administrator there at Cooper Petey. Those are the, that's the context in which you're making these comments. Yeah, but Ricky, could I just say one other thing? Yep. Um, uh, you know, the real issue in Cooper Petey is the water issue at the moment. We pay three times what Adelaide people pay for their water. We raised this with the government in 2019. We had a petition, 960 people signed it. We went to the parliament calling for water price equality, you know, not to pay three times, which would necessitate uh, a subsidy from the state government. And we get so we get a subsidy for electricity to bring, the, bring prices down to uh, Adelaide prices, yet we don't get one for water which you could argue that water is a more important essential service than electricity and yet one is, you know, electricity subsidised and water isn't. So we've been asking the government since 2019 for this and I've, I've done some, some stuff in the last few days. I've, you know, I've written to all MLCs just asking them a couple of questions around do they believe it's equitable for Cooper Pedy people to pay three times what Adelaide people paid for their, for their water. In the last, uh, since 2019, the town, a small town of 1,500, 1,600 people, has paid five million dollars extra for their water than they would have if they lived in Adelaide. Between that number of people, five million collectively. 
Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so um, you know, and 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 you know, I've written to the government about this, and um, they set up a task force back in August last year. It's met once. You know, it is just it ain't that difficult. <laughs> is it something? Has it been? And we and we've reported on this before on Flow. But is it something that has ever been kicked around the idea of maybe SA Water taking over that responsibility? Yeah, yeah that's what I. That's what I. My my proposition is that we that we sell the assets. The assets are worth about twelve mil. That we sell them to SA Water and they take it over. And that would clear the council's debt, which is ten million at the moment. So. Um, you know, I've... Which seems peculiar when you consider SA Water has often been referred in state politics as a cash cow for whoever's in government because it's incredibly flush for funds. It seems odd they don't want to take it on even if it means cross-subsidising the uh, expensive cost of providing it there for others in the rest of the state. Yeah, no, well, look, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, it's just a... It's, it's, look, it's historic. Uh, why, are we do, why are we doing the water? In fact... In fact, the NWS, which was the forerunner to the SA Water, they used to run the water system in Cooper Pedy. And there is a reason which I won't bore you with, but the council took it over. They've done it before. And funnily enough, we've got an Aboriginal community in town and the, the water um, distribution in that, little, in that small Aboriginal community is actually uh, SA Water's responsibility. It's, it's crazy. So it's called Oomana Community, part of Cooper Pedy. So it's an Aboriginal, there's probably 20 odd houses there, Ab- Aboriginal in- um, uh, occupants. And so we sell the water to SA Water, <laughs> who then distribute it to those houses. I mean, how crazy is that? Uh, mm, something we'll um, chase up with some of the state authorities on that one as well. But Tim Jackson, look, not only thank you for your time today, but uh, have, a, have a good break, a well-earned break in India as well. Good on you, Ricky. Thank you. Cheers, Tim.